What's, What's up, up guys? guys? It's Terry and Rowan bringing you another episode of HC Economics Review. Yeah, and diving in today, um, finally, you know, after this long back and forth, back and forth between US, the USA and China with their trade dispute, finally, I feel like we, we've kind of reached, you know, a, a step in the right direction, in, in, my, in my opinion. Now, feel free to disagree with that. Uh, so, in, on the, January the 15th of uh, 2020 this year, uh, they finally were able to accomplish phase one. So, they signed a trade deal agreement uh, hoping to maybe make some headwinds to resolving this dispute uh, and so we're going to dive into that uh, today but we're also just going to look at how that impacts Australia because remember we do need to focus on the Australia's relationship with the rest of the world the global economy uh, so getting right into it do you want to just give us some basic details of what was just signed yeah I mean look there's a lot that's gone on and there's a lot that's not in this agreement as well um, so if we try to simplify it you know, there's really um, four major components and then, uh, well, okay, let's be honest, six major things that we're going to actually highlight, but a couple of them will dive in a little bit more in depth and others will skim over. I think that the big thing is really it's about um, solidifying reforms around intellectual property. Um, so that's one of the first things that's happened to you, um, which um, I think has been really interesting. What the US has tried to always do as part of this, and it's why it's been called a technology and trade dispute is that there's been a big drive here on the back of uh, the US to really get better intellectual property protection out of China, particularly after China announced their you know, Made in China 2025 policy. Now, what the agreement has done is really tied the intellectual property reforms to the trade agreement. And I think that's really interesting um, because it means that the US now has greater leverage than they've had in the past around actually trying to get the intellectual property reforms implemented. Now, if they don't get implemented or they happen slowly, uh, you know, they've got this trade agreement that's got some leverage here for the US to actually sort of place more pressure on China. So that, that's really the first sort of thing, okay, that's happening here. It's really about uh, some of the intellectual property stuff being implemented. Um, I think ultimately though, um, most of the tariffs have been unchanged, right? So all of the stuff that we saw happen in the lead up, that's largely been the same, okay? So if we have a look at it, the only change that's really been made is that there was some September 15 tariffs that were placed on, um, on $150 billion worth of China's exports. That's been reduced from 15 to 7.5%. Every other thing that has happened, and you can check out our prior episode where we do a deep dive on the trade dispute, everything else has just been agreed upon now is instead of it being tit-for-tat tariffs, it's now a trade agreement. Yeah, so I, was, I just want to add into that. So uh, aside from just the tariffs being unchanged, uh, a lot of the US's just suspicion, right, of, of nasty wrongdoings from China, they've actually almost just been solidified in an agreement, right? So uh, the US has this, what they call the entities list, which basically just lists uh, organizations or that, that the US is a bit wary of doing business with. And uh, Huawei last year, we discussed this in a video as well. They were caught basically spying right through their telecommunications networks uh, and so they have remained actually on that list right um, and that basically I guess for me shows that the US is really starting to gain a bit of leverage here because they're, they're making China kind of fess up to some of the things which perhaps they weren't really fessing up to in the past. That's right and I think if we look at that idea of leverage there's 105 commitments um, uh, you know that China have made to the US there's 88 joint commitments where they make commitments to each other and there's just five commitments that the US is making. Uh, I think you can definitely see that idea of leverage definitely starting to play out. Now, we've also got you know, China accepting, and this is a smaller thing, but some you know, of the US food security standards. Um, and I think that's just part of you know, uh, trying to get China into this common set of agreements globally, which is a small step. Um, I think perhaps the, the bigger thing, and this is the, the sort of uh, sort of fourth thing here that we're looking at is um, really some purchases around energy products. Do you want to share a little bit more about that? Okay, so underneath this, this deal, China's agreed to purchase extra $18.5 billion in energy products and 30 this year and $34 billion extra dollars next year. Uh, and that's including things like uh, power cars and planes and factories, uh, which is a huge, 
huge increase from what it was the year before uh, and as well as 2017. So they're really getting China to step their game up uh, and, and help out, I guess, with those US. And I mean, industries. they're so big that in some cases it's a 275% increase. So I think the thing that we need to really uh, look at here, and it's going to be something we can unpack more in the impact, is to what extent is China setting themselves up for a bit of failure here? Or is the US setting China up to maybe fail this, which places China under more pressure to make more concessions in phase two? So that's something to think about, um, because I think we're going to start seeing a little bit of that play out. Now, there's been another win here, which is, uh, and this is more for China, you know, the US has taken them off the list of, you know, currency manipulators, whether or not that's true or not. Yeah. <laughs> that's another yeah, story. Because in the past, basically, the US uh, accused China of devaluing their currency, basically making it more attractive for them to sell their exports. Uh, and, and yeah, they, I guess, have taken them off. That's right. And then the final big thing, as we said, there's six. So we've covered, this is the sixth thing here, is that, um, you know, China have also agreed to purchase $200 billion of, of uh, specific uh, you know, exports from the US. Now, it's interesting that these were very tightly defined. Uh, they were around manufactured, you know, agriculture services and as we talked about energy. And the interesting thing is that this has really come as the back of, you know, special interest groups lobbying in the US. Yeah. And so it is going to have quite a, an interesting impact on exports from other countries. So Australia being one of them, um, but certainly, you know, Canada, Russia, Brazil as well. Um, and this really highlights you know, I think one of the, the challenges with trade agreements, which is that they don't necessarily increase global trade, they simply create trade diversion. Mm -hmm. And that's what part of this agreement may start to create is some trade diversion occurring. Now, that's probably a nice segue really to impact, you know, of this. Now, before we dive specifically in the impact for Australia, Terry, what are some of the impacts more at a global level of this phase one of the trade agreement being signed? Well, I think the best thing is it's kind of given us, uh, given China uh, a bit of calm. I mean, obviously they've got a lot going on just with the coronavirus as, as it is. So it's given them just a, it's maybe bought them a bit of time uh, just to figure out exactly where they should go with resolving, how, how they want to resolve this dispute. Uh, so it's not just something which they're constantly thinking about. And the IMF seems to agree with that. Uh, they recently upped their GDP projections for, for China from 5.8 to 6% for 2020. Uh, although I do believe that was... It was again, prior to Corona. Yeah. So who knows what it's going to look like. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like we're saying that a lot. We are. <laughs> it's going to be uh, ongoing, I think. Now, it's interesting because it's also expected to have a positive impact for the US. Uh, again, whether or not you believe all of this data, that's the hard thing because this is coming from a White House economic advisor, a guy called Larry Kudlow, who is claiming that the agreement will boost uh, you know, US GDP by 0.5% uh, in each of the next two successive years. Now, which is a lot. It is yeah. a lot. And we've got to remember, you know, US growth has sort of uh, slowed at 2.3% in 2019. Um, it is coming up to an election cycle yeah, as well. Good. So, you know, this agreement, uh, you know, certainly is interesting. And, and the, the, I think the propaganda, and I think we could call it that, that's going to come around this agreement, around its economic impact, may be a little hard to decipher, actually, in a US economy context because of the election cycle they're in. And, and perhaps, you know, maybe it wasn't the main intention, but that probably will also influence the kind of products which the US has made China import, right? just because those uh, are manufacturing products and though that tends to be a very key, you know, like seat for the, for the Republicans to win. It's interesting though, because I think it's a really great point that you highlight that, because if we look at it, the benefit is that the US gets to sell more goods to China, particularly agriculture and energy. Uh, manufacturing maybe actually hasn't featured yeah. as strongly. Yeah. Um, and that's the interesting thing because the initial, and I don't think it was, I think that the, the, the intellectual property was probably the actual bigger underlying driver. But if we remember the, the bigger driver of this from a, you know, a Trump election cycle was with very much, you know, the poor towns in, you know, regional and rural US manufacturing, let's bring manufacturing back. Yeah. And the early indications, at least for phase one, is yeah. that it won't do as much perhaps as was expected, given the initial rhetoric uh, around yeah. the trade dispute. Yeah. Um, Especially because like the results that have come in for the, for the past three years have actually been that uh, the jobs around, you know, what they call the Rust Belt in the US, those, those, those uh, manufacturing towns have actually fallen. There's 16,000 jobs that have been lost in the manufacturing actually. So uh, as you were saying, I think it is really just rhetoric, right? And uh, it just depends on whether the voters 
can see past that. That's right. And I mean, I'm sure there'll be good attempts to ensure they don't. <laughs> <laughs> now, I think it, it, as part of that, you know, what's interesting about all of this is that it has really highlighted China's dependence on the US for key foundational technology. I mean, China has made a lot of concessions here as part of this. Um, US have really taken them to account. And so, you know, it does highlight what we talked about in the prior video that we did on the US-China trade dispute, that the US had a window of time, with China's growth as an economy, they had a window of time to really use the leverage they had around technology to try to create change, um, and arguably they're doing it. Um, China have needed to do it because they have been more manufacturing-led, they haven't yet had that ability to produce more of the elaborately transformed manufacturers using their own technology and intellectual property knowledge. Um, and so it has highlighted that, you know, um, there is a dependence here and they're needing to have to come to the table about it. You know, if we dive in a little bit more, I think what's interesting about all of this is that, um, you know, not surprisingly, we talked about some of the impact around trade diversion already, but, you know, this trade agreement doesn't meet WTO uh, sort of uh, policy and principle, right? which is funny because one of the criticisms initially that prompted the US to take China to account was that China was failing to meet WTO, uh, you know, commitments and was also, you know, failing to rectify it after being warned countless times. So how does this, uh, you know, agreement transgress WTO sort of conditions? Well, before I just dive, I want to just maybe make a comment about, maybe that just says something about the role of the WTO and how much uh, significance they might have in the global economy. Uh, I think it's important, yeah, if you remember from topic one, it is important to not just take these international organisations at face value, really get in there and critique them as, as Roland loves to do, right? Sca a scathing critique, as he says, right? But um, in terms of violating WTO uh, uh, rules and, and conditions, Basically, this one violates the, the most favoured nation um, principle, which basically states that if one country provides, you know, some favourable trading agreement or, or, or deal, uh, they've got to provide that for the other countries that they trade with. But let's be honest, pretty much every trade <laughs> agreement, <laughs> you know, that's, oh, yeah. not, that's not substantially multilateral or in the case of, you know, a, a, a sort of um, a, an APEC that is non-exclusionary, right, um, and non-discriminatory, pretty much every single trade agreement is going to breach this most favoured nature principle, right? Because it's going to give, yeah. um, you know, uh, preferred status to that trading partner. So it's not surprising, really, is it? But it's interesting that the WTO is trying to make some noise about it, which does indicate, here I go with my scathing uh, commentary about our favourite friend of the WTO, it does indicate that they're struggling to maintain relevance and they're trying to get into the narrative here. Yeah. Uh, and I think, you know, failing to do so. Now, I think... Um, if we really, I think, zoom out for a moment now and look at Australia, you know, we've really spent a lot of time looking at uh, globally. Um, and I think the final comment I want to make is that this is phase one. There is phase two and ongoing, and phase two actually deals with the more contentious issues. So they've sort of basically agreed and solidified everything they already did. And phase two is going to be the much more challenging. And I think it's also why Trump is pushing it potentially to post-election because it may not end up being quite as one-sided because I think China may hold firmer on some of it because it's going to really threaten China's handling of state-owned enterprises, um, which is sort of core to really a central, somewhat centrally planned economy. Yeah. Now, Australia, impact on Australia, Terry, what is going to be some of the impact of this phase one, at least, um, agreement on Australia? So we've talked about how our exports have actually done reasonably well uh, over the past year, mainly due to the weaker Australian dollar, but also just because of this ongoing tension, right? So obviously, you know, there were supply issues from both the, the Chinese and US economies, so they were almost, I wouldn't say forced, but they were heavily encouraged, right, to, to make purchases of Australian exports, particularly in things like agriculture and, and commodities. Well, that's right. It's made some of the US exports more expensive, yeah. particularly in those areas. Where are they going to come? Well, Australia, yeah. right? So um, what's been some of that impact then? Uh, you know, like we've been able to take advantage of this mm -hmm. um, over the last couple of years and we should still, maybe the benefit of being able to do that will diminish maybe a yeah. little bit, but, but probably not because all this agreement has done is locked in those tariffs. So if anything, right, if it's locked in those tariffs, we should still see some of this flow to Australia. So what's a couple of industries where we've seen some, some positive impacts of the actual trade dispute really looking at things like cotton and almond and other kind of commodities we have done quite well there 
Uh, so we doubled the volume of cotton. Uh, almonds have gone up sixfold, which is pretty crazy, crazy right? Crazy, right? Lots of almonds. Yeah, that's right. Uh, um, Everyone loves their almond milk. <laughs> Um, so it does show that there has been in all of this sort of trade dispute uncertainty some bright spots where we've seen really as a result of the tariffs a trade diversion occur where China's going well we're going to go elsewhere for this stuff and they've come to Australia now this obviously then gets impacted by coronavirus if then we're selling even more to China right and you know coronavirus hits it may make it a little bit um, more questionable about the, the impact that has now it's interesting because there is some risk here for particularly our, our you know, natural gas exports. Um, what's some of the risk for natural gas? Well, in Australia, we, we have seen a, a growth in our natural gas uh, industries in the past couple of years. Uh, we have been really exploring that. But the US, I guess, is a much more matured market in that sense. Uh, and so obviously, if they've locked in, you know, that they've had to purchase certain quantities of uh, natural gas, I believe that's going to really divert it back towards. That's the right, US. because if we remember, there was 18 billion and then 34 billion in, in energy yeah. exports that need to be purchased between China and uh, the US, and that's a significant increase, um, you know, 275% increase on China's prior purchases from the US. They're not just going to buy this stuff yeah. for the sake of it, yeah, there's well, going to be a trade come, diversion, yeah. it's going to come from somewhere else probably Australia yeah. especially because LNG is not particularly you know mined in many different places it's actually banned in a lot of countries yeah. that's right so um, I think the key thing is it's expected a Commonwealth Bank analyst has identified that despite Trade Minister Simon Birmingham playing down the risk um, you know they've done uh, analysis that indicates that almost 10% or 50 billion dollars worth of LNG exports could be lost to the US as a result of this so yeah, look, it's a little bit, of, it's a bit of a mixed response right now. It's like, well, look, we've been able to reach some benefits already. Mm. Those benefits will continue to occur because the, the phase one has just locked in a lot of the tariffs. But on the flip side, um, you know, it also may result in some of our LNG exports reducing. So how that will balance out remains to be seen, right? The, the cost and the benefit for Australia. Um, so any final comments about the impact of phase one of the US-China trade agreement on Australia or the global economy, Terry? Well, I think it just didn't really hit what we were, you know, the, the, the meat of the issue. So I think we should probably just wait and see. Um, but I think, yeah, definitely locking in those tariffs will probably give at least a little bit of certainty in this uncertain environment we're currently in. That's right, which, you know, certainty is always going to go a long way, without a doubt. So look, guys, if you have any questions or comments about... The US-China trade agreement phase one, its impact on the global or domestic economy. You've heard some other stuff about it that you think would be valuable to share. Leave it in the comments below. You know, if you're watching this in class and you guys have an epic discussion, let us know. We'd love to find out. Of course, uh, you know, if you haven't already, um, hit the subscribe button. We do videos every single week. And so as a result, we will see you next time.